Our reading today is from 1 Samuel 17, and as you can see, page 404 in your few Bibles. 1 Samuel 17. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Soko in Judah. They pitched camp at Ephes Damon between Soko and Azekar. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another, with the valley between them. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armour of bronze, weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs he wore bronze greaves, and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and his iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This day... I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' word, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Now David was the son of an Ephrathite named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem in Judah. He had eight sons and in Saul's time he was very old. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to the war. The firstborn was Eliad, the second Abinadab, and the third Shamar. David was the youngest. The three oldest followed Saul. But David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For 40 days the Philistine came forward every morning and evening, and took his stand. Now Jesse said to his son David, Take this ephah of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. Take along these cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. They are with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. Early in the morning, David left the flock in the care of a shepherd, loaded up and set out as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out to battle positions, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines facing each other. David left his things with the keeper of supplies rang to the battle lines and asked his brothers how they were. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance. And David heard it. Whatever the Israelites saw that man, they all fled from him in great fear. Now the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes his disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? They repeated to him what they had been saying and told him, this is what will be done for the man who kills him. When Elia, David's oldest brother, 
heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, Why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Now what have I done? asked David. Can't I even speak? He then turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter. And the men answered him as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. David said to Saul, Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, You are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from the mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine because he has defied the army of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armour on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said and I will give you all your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcass of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, but the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from the sheath. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and to the gates of Ekron. Their dead were strewn along the Sharain Road to Gath and Ekron. 
when the Philistines returned from chasing them, they plundered their camp. David took the Philistine's head and brought it to Jerusalem. He put the Philistine's weapon in his own tent. As Saul watched David going out to meet the Philistine, he said to Abner, commander of the army, Abner, whose son is that young man? Abner replied, as surely as you live, your majesty, I don't know. The king said, find out whose son this young man is. As soon as David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul, with David still holding the Philistine's head. Whose son are you, young man? Saul asked him. David said, I am the son of your servant Jesse of Bethlehem. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well done, Judith. What a great reading. Good morning. Love to see you. I wonder whether you've been mocked for what you believe recently. Have you been in the audience of a stand-up comedian uh, doing the usual digs at Christians for the cheap laughs? Uh, how did it feel? Uh, or it might be more personal than that. Was it a member of your own family stirring you up uh, for believing in fairy tales or whatever they say to you? How do you feel when you're mocked? Do you feel isolated, alone, lacking backup? Now, as you read of the government's latest plans to curb religious freedoms... Uh, as you hear of Christians being persecuted more and more, how do you feel? Uh, do you feel like an underdog? Do you feel marginalised, excluded, foolish, under threat? Friends, some of those feelings are no doubt what the people on this battlefield felt, the Israelites as they faced the Philistines and they heard the taunt of the Philistine champion, Goliath. But one Israelite didn't feel like that. And we're going to spend some time uh, with David this morning, he hearing what it is to have confidence in the God who saves. Uh, so let's first listen to Goliath, hear that threat. Uh, then uh, let's listen to David's convictions. Uh, challenged by his brothers, uh, uh, challenged by his king, and then finally challenged by Goliath. Uh, so first we meet the great threat to, to God's people. Once again, Israel are invaded by Philistines, uh, the Philistines. Uh, verse 2, have you got it there in front of you? Chapter 17, verse 2, uh, Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped at the Valley of Elah. They drew up their battle lines to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another uh, with the valley in between them. It feels like we've been here before, doesn't it? Don't you feel like we've been here before? Chapter 13, chapter 14, it, it all feels a little bit familiar, doesn't it? But there is one difference, and that is the way that they're going to do battle. It's champion versus champion, a, a battle where each army's fate apparently relies on the success of their champion. Um, and we very quickly meet the champion from uh, uh, the Philistine forces, don't we? Verse 4, a champion named Goliath who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. And you, you hear of all that bronze there. He had a bronze helmet. He had a scale of armour. Uh, he had his legs were bronze graves, bronze javelin, and the spear shaft, verse 7, uh, with an iron point weighing more than, uh, weighed 600 shekels. All this bronze armour, it sounds to me a bit like a, one of those brown snakes. You know, just that's what he just looks like this massive brown snake out of a horror story with lethal strike powder match. Uh, the, the steel tip weighing more than his armor. Uh, like, this is, this is quite an image, isn't it? Now, right through this historical record, what you see is important, but what you hear is even more important. Listen carefully to what they're saying. Listen carefully to what, what this big brown snake says. Verse 10. 
Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistine words, Saul and the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. He says, give me a man, choose me a man, he says. And we know that Israel have already chosen a man, haven't they? They've already chosen a man a head taller than the others. They've already chosen a man who will go out and do battle for them. Uh, We know that. But that man, King Saul, remains unmoved. That man is listed among the people in verse 11 who are dismayed and terrified. The king they had chosen, the man who hid in baggage, now we presume hides in his tent. Goliath comes out for 40 days, says the same thing twice for 40 days. 40 days is often a time of testing in the Bible. Saul has been tested and found wanting. 40 days, 80 opportunities to respond to this call. Crickets. So we've heard the threat and that goes unanswered. But we're about to meet the one who will answer that threat. And it's going to be a mismatch. Uh, Now, almost to emphasise his smallness almost to emphasise his insignificance. We need to travel away from the battlefield. He's not even there. We need to travel away from the battlefield to the wilderness, to the back blocks of Bethlehem, where the paddock's outside Bethlehem. This this guy isn't fighting shoulder to shoulder with his brothers. No, 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 he's way too young for that. Uh, I was once conducting communion. It wasn't at this church. And uh, this uh, little boy comes up to the communion rail uh, with his mum and dad and his uh, uh, baby sister. And uh, I, was going, I went to pray for him and so I said, Champ, what's your name? And he looked up at me and said, Big Boy. <laughs> so I had to say, Dear Lord, bless Big Boy. But, uh, you know, uh, but that's who David is, right? He's Big Boy. You know, like he wants to be with Big Boys on the front, but he's looking after these sheep. Uh, uh, he's protecting, leading, caring these, this, the family's sheep rather than actually being on the battlefield. This little fellow finally gets a break, though, to run an errand for Dad. Uh, even as Jesse sends him, you can hear Jesse talking down to him as if he doesn't know what's going on. Your brother isn't on the battlefield. Of course he knows that. He's been there before, right? And this is how it goes. He races, you can imagine big boy racing off to the battlefield. Uh, he leaves the sheep in the capable hands of another. And after the 32 kilometre trek, uh, he drops off the supplies. It seems like he does that pretty quickly so he can get to the battle lines. Uh, uh, and he doesn't like a previous king hide in the baggage with the supplies, but he goes straight to the battle line. And when he gets to the battlefront, David listens to the now well rehearsed threats of Goliath, which fills him with questions. In fact, these questions are the first record words of this future king. Significantly, both questions concern the disgrace that is upon the people of the living God. David asks, verse 26, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? See, David is just a mere pup. And uh, he, he's tantalised by everything. He seems so, uh, so, so innocent and so strikingly unembarrassed to ask spiritual questions. And in doing that, David is the first one that brings up the topic of God amongst the Israelites. While Saul and his army are gripped with fear, David is gripped by this disgrace that is upon the Lord. In the words of this uncircumcised Philistine. David just can't hear it. He he won't tolerate it. David knows that to mock Israel is to mock God. Uh, Yahweh's name matters. The reputation of the Lord matters. David wants God honoured. Do you? Do you want God honoured? When the stand-up comic is getting their easy laughs or when the politician is scoring cheap points or when your brother or your friend 
and I'm mocking you. I'm often embarrassed, but to my shame, I'm not like David. I'm really like David, consumed by God's reputation. David, the young shepherd from Bethlehem, is so clearly mismatched with Goliath, uh, yet he bristles at this threat to the Lord and his people. Godly actions rarely occur before godly convictions. Godly convictions occur before godly actions, right? And you see that with David. We, we see these godly convictions before we see any action from him. But before we see how he acts on these godly convictions, these convictions get tested first by his brother and then by his king. And then finally we'll hear how his convictions get tested by Goliath. It's one thing to have strong convictions. It's quite another to have them tested. Uh, David is the only one in Israel asking about the shame of God's name. It, it was difficult to tolerate for his big brother Eliab. I have to admit this is one of my favourite parts of the story. Uh, and perhaps it's just because I'm a younger brother. I don't know. Uh, but sometimes, you, you know, you read the Bible and it seems so ancient and the culture seems so foreign. But sometimes you read the Bible and you think, this could have happened around the dinner table yesterday. And I reckon this is one of those passages, right? Verse 28, when Eliab, David's older brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger and asked, why have you come down here? With whom did you leave those sheep and the few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are, how wicked your heart is. You only came down here to watch the battle. Now what have I done? Says David, can I even talk? You can just imagine it, can't you? Just emphasising, this is the kid brother. This is big boy, you know, being too big for his boots. The first challenge to his convictions comes from his own brother. As you listen to Eliab's comments, do you recognise just how similar to Goliath he sounds? Why did you come here? That's what Goliath says. He's scornful. He's belittling uh, uh, those little sheep, the, the little flock in the wilderness uh, and his presumed self-importance. I am the one that knows your heart, little brother. Yeah? The irony is that Eliab's suggestion uh, that he knew the evil that was in David's heart, as chapter 16 readers, we all know that God has chosen this one and God doesn't choose with his eyes, with appearances. He chooses with the heart, right? We know that. And so we can see Eliab's comment for what it is. And these walls have got ears. And the only candle that's not melting in fear becomes obvious to King Saul. And David comes before King Saul. David demonstrates his willingness to put his convictions to the test here. Verse 31, what David said was overheard and reported to Saul and Saul sent for him. Verse 32, uh, David said to Saul, ne let, no one lose a account, uh, sorry, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul then proceeds to challenge David, to, to, to question him. Eliab questioned his heart. Saul questions his age and his experience. 33, Saul replied, replied, you're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man and he's been a warrior from his youth. Saul then dresses David up in his armour, which must look like a bit like a kid getting in dad's work clothes, you know, um, and like Eliab, Saul sounds a bit like Goliath too, uh, putting his confidence in what is seen, putting his confidence in a strong armour. Uh, do you notice where David's confidence is? It's not in that armour, is it? Verse 34, David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, I struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by the hair, struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord, verse 37, who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. This is the first mention of the name Yahweh or Lord in this chapter. 
And David is testifying to the saving power of Yahweh before this king. The future shepherd of Israel is relying on the God of Israel's saving power. To him, Goliath is not just a symbol of might and power. He's just another threat to the sheep. So David had to uh, defend his convictions first to his brother, then to his king. But now he's got to defend his convictions on the battlefield uh, before this mammoth enemy of God's people. Verse 40. And then he took his staff his hand. in his hand. He chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch, uh, pouch of his shepherd's bag. And with his uh, sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with, with health and handsome. And he despised him. Goliath said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. You can see how people conclude that this is an underdog story, can't you? Um, It's even got the word dog in it. Um, Underdog comes from the dog fighting games of the 1800s. And in these fights, the underdog was the dog in the lower position uh, and the dog that was expected by the uh, gamblers watching uh, to to, to get done over. But if you listen to David's response to Goliath's threat, you'll hear that David actually doesn't regard himself as the underdog at all. David regards Goliath as the underdog. Goliath says, verse 44, come here and I'll give you your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. David said to the Philistine, verse 45, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and wild animals and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into our hands. Remember listening to the words in this passage. It's way more important to what we see. What you're hearing from David is very clear, isn't it? The Lord will not be mocked. The Lord of heaven and earth is actually on my side. Consequently, you will die and the whole world will know that our God saves. Verse 48, as the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag, taking out a stone, he slung it and struck, it and, uh, struck the, the Philistine on the forehead. Uh, the, the stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. Goliath fell face down just like his hometown deity, Dagon. Do you remember that back in chapter 5? Dagon fell flat on his face as the ark was moved into his temple. Same thing for Goliath. This one who mocked and blasphemed God was actually literally stoned for it. And then the mop-up operation takes place. And we're followed by a flash forward in verse 54. David took the Philistine's head and brought it to Jerusalem. Now, the Israelites aren't in Jerusalem yet. Uh, this is, so this is a flash forward to, to way forward to 2 Samuel uh, 5 when King David captures Jerusalem and brings this skull into the city. Now, I don't know if you recognise this as a Judith read it, but there's a really weird, weird section at the end of this passage. Were you, were, were you still with us at that point listening to that uh, about the identity of David? It's very odd. Uh, um, Uh, We read chapter 16 last week 
uh, where Saul chooses David uh, to come into his court. Uh, it's weird to us because we know this. We've read chapter 16. We know that Saul calls David by name in chapter 16. We know that uh, Saul knows David's father, Jesse, in chapter 16. You're thinking, oh, what's going on here, Saul? Uh, uh, but, but here in 1755-56, Saul is asking the question that he should know the answer to. Now, perhaps he's got some sort of amnesia, I don't know. Uh, but perhaps he's asking questions he already knows the answer to for the sake of the uh, battlefield commander. Uh, I might be wrong here, but I imagine the writer of this historical account placed the episode of si chapter 16 before the ch episode of chapter 17 so that we'd know what was going on, we'd know what was really going on. Uh, so we'd know the bigger picture as we came to chapter 17. But I suspect the episode in chapter 16 actually took place after this battle in 17. I, I suspect that the writer did that to help us to see what God is doing here, that he's bringing to the fore his anointed one, David. He's bringing to the fore the one who he's placed his spirit on. And by comparison, God is showing the one who he's taken his spirit away from, King Saul. Again, I could be wrong. I'd love to hear why you think it's ordered the way it is. Uh, but whatever it doesn't do, that last paragraph establishes the issue that will dominate the rest of this book, uh, the relationship between the rejected King Saul and the king who we now know is going to end up in Jerusalem with Goliath's head. So, friends, I, I want to bring this back to where we feel like the underdog, uh, where we are uh, mocked or where we feel a little bit in our society alone or marginalised. Uh, Goliath and the Philistines posed a massive threat to the people of God. Uh, David, though, was solid in his convictions. He was challenged by Eliab in his heart. He was challenged by Saul questioning his experiences. Uh, Goliath questioned his size and his weapons. But, but, but we see David acted. In, with confidence in the saving power of God, didn't he? There was no question for him. Uh, David and Goliath is one of the few uh, Bible stories uh, that are used in our media. I guarantee you'll hear David and Goliath some point over the Olympics. They'll say, this is a David and Goliath battle here, right? Um, but but uh, the, uh, what we see here uh, is a man who doesn't, Think of it in those terms, like the David and Goliath battle that we speak of. Uh, David is absolutely certain that he's not the underdog. He's absolutely certain that Goliath is the underdog, which, which messes with the way that we use David and Goliath. Uh, this is clearly a mismatch, but it's a, not the mismatch that people see with their eyes. If God it is against Goliath, nothing can help him. And David knows that. And, and so, yes, this is a battle of champions. Yes, it's an underdog story, but not in the way that we think. And that comes from the confidence in the God who saves. It points forward to another battle of champions where one figure is on the cross looking to all the world like he's been defeated. But on the third day, God rises him from death to life as the Lord of all. And when you're mocked, when you're feeling marginalised, you get to hear the words of your risen Lord say to you, do not be afraid. I'm the first and the last. I'm the living one. I was dead, and now look, I'm alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Revelation 1.17. To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life an atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may go in. Why don't you stand? We'll sing.